uh, American congressman. He participated, uh, he was uh, part of the uh, Vice President Al Gore's uh, election campaign. He was, uh, he worked as a, um, he works in the government for many years. He worked in the administration of the president, he worked uh, in Samruk Kazina. He actually chaired uh, the uh, Center for International Programs, which administers Bolashak. For, so, uh, Bolashakers, please round of applause to say something there. <laughs> so, I'm all very grateful to him for everything that he has done during uh, his term as a Bolashak. He also been the manage managing director of the AIFC. At the moment, he is no longer with the government. He is an independent uh, education expert. He is also chief educational officer at uh, BTS and uh, a goodwill ambassador to Nation Geographic. Uh, so, um, so please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Cesar Vermeer. <laughs> So let, if I go off limits, just let me know and let's, I'm a guest speaker anyway, so I'm not a part of a member of those ones uh, So let me start with uh, a personal story, which happened to me about six months ago, well, February, five months ago. Uh, you know, a lot of experts nowadays now talk about quarter-life crisis. We had midlife crisis which comes to an average person out to 40. Yeah, there's a good movie about that. This is 40. Uh, but now, this quarter-life crisis uh, is on the table. And this midlife crisis, just basically what, what happens, it, the midlife crisis happens earlier than expected. And it happens at 30, when you're past 30. Sometimes it even happens earlier. Why? Because everything is changing so fast that people start experiencing existential problems, big, you know, life or death, purpose of life problems much earlier. Because they're engaged in many activities much earlier than we used to be engaged 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So uh, today I was asked to talk about skills of the future. What is changing? The labor market, education, skills, competencies, demands um, to an average person. The person, everything is changing. And I promised you a personal story. So here I was, five months ago, February, at Bay Area, at Mountain View, at Google Brain offices. Google Brain is a very new branch of Google company. They focused on artificial intelligence and all these fancy things we see from time to time, like Sundar Pichai introducing uh, Google Assistant's Duplex, an AI that you know makes your calls and arranges your meetings and, and, and calls the shops, barber shops, and, and arranges your haircut. You've watched the fancy presentation. It's done by this specific team. There are about 300 explorers, researchers, PhDs, and experts who focus on AI and machine learning and try to come up with new ways of individualizing, personalizing AI. It is headed by a very famous person, um, one of the leading engineers of Google, who is behind the Google search algorithm. Everybody knows that person, anyway, so you just go look him up. 
So I was interviewed by a uh, like Google Brain apply for Google Brain. After many years in civil service, I decided to completely switch off my background and past and try something extremely new to myself. Extremely new. It's uh, artificial intelligence. Um, it's machine learning and trying to come up with new ways of education. How do we uh, find ways to personalize education? And it was a complete failure. It was a complete disaster. I came up with uh, all that years of experience in education, and, you know, hundreds of languages, you know, <laughs> and thousands of years of tennis stories, <laughs> right? And, uh, and I was rejected. I didn't get the job. And yes, I didn't get the job and for that position, for that particular position. And I, I made two disclaimers, so I just aim too hard. It is go go. I'm the world leading innovator company. And my second disclaimer was, oh, the position was too too hard. You know, it's a managerial position. But anyways, I was in an interview room with a bunch of young kids, like five hundred of them. Mostly Asian and Indian, mostly you would imagine. And that, you know, that particular moment when I got rejected, I was out of the room and I was interviewed for several hours, and I was shown that all my skills were not transferable. And they have termed that transferable skills. If you work in some particular area and the skills you gain, the experience you gain can be transferred to uh, to their particular area of interest. And I had none of them. With all the years of the civil service uh, uh, and managerial positions and in Baldashak and ministries and administration and president and some of and all the different companies and organizations I worked for, I had none of the key transferable skills demanded by Google Brain. And that was a revelation. Basically, I was broke down from the hill I thought I was on. To, to, to the valley of death and desperation and desolation and despair. And that night, that particular night, I was sitting in my hotel room and I couldn't sleep, obviously. And I would start thinking to myself, geez, man, you're not that experienced. You're not that skilled. You don't have that, that knowledge, that much knowledge. I mean, you have a lot of knowledge which is not applicable. So I started thinking, hmm. What should I look for? What are the skills that I needed? What and how quickly I can acquire it? That is the, one of the key questions. Because you spend too much of your time, too much of your best years and youth years and the energy in certain areas, hoping that you gain a lot of experience that you, know, you might build on. And then all of a sudden you learn when you were 36 years old that much, you know, you haven't focused in the right direction. So that's painful for the starters, and uh, hopefully you will not go through that same painful process and period of your time when you are my age. So first let me start with a certain book that I believe everybody should read, which was written many years ago, I mean relatively many years ago, 1962. An American author, historian, philosopher, um, he called himself, I am the historian of science. I look into the history of science and technology. His name was Thomas Kuhn, and he wrote this book in 1962 where he predicted, not predicted, he came along to certain, certain rules, certain formulas, certain principles that shape the world as we know it. And the terminology he coined, industrial revolutions, modernizations, the paradigm shift, which is, which is used very frequently today. Every day, in every book, in every media, in every Facebook page, we hear these words. The fourth industrial revolution, the, the, the uh, industrial shift, the industry 4.0. And all this terminology was shaped and coined by this particular author, by this particular scientist, Thomas Kuhn. 
So his book is called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. If you want to understand why this big change is happening, how this big change is happening, why this big change is happening, you should read this book very carefully. It is translated in many, many languages, in Russian and Kazakh. Ah, we have this wonderful project, 100 new books, new, new textbooks, and it's part of the working group. And I couldn't persuade people to put this book in that list, unfortunately. But it should be in that list anyway. So I think for the next stage, they, they might include that book. So please do read it. It's, you can find it online everywhere. It's quite old book. The ideas of Thomas Kuhn, the idea of Thomas Kuhn is very simple. So he looked in carefully into every single technological revolution that happened in human history. There were four of them. The fifth, the first one, the agrarian, the uh, uh, revolution happened about 10,000 years ago. We, we won't count that on, but so free industrial revolutions happened. About two, in, I mean, if you look, in history of humankind, it's nothing. History of Earth, it's even it's milliseconds. It's 200, 300 years of our existence, the existence of humankind. So the first, first industrial revolution started with steam engine, and then by a Scottish guy, 1762, 65. Yeah, but I mean, I won't spend much time. That's why I don't like it. Because you know you have to go deep and explain these principles that are quite important. But uh, the basic principle is very, very simple in a way. So what Thomas Kuhn has discovered: the basic technology. There's a great movie, Arrival. If you watch that movie about the aliens coming and language and everything, and there's a debate between a linguist. As an expert in linguistics and languages and theoretical physicist. And the linguist says language defines civilization. Any civilization is defined by its language. And the theoretical physicist says no, technology defines the civilization. So civilization is defined in Thomas Kuhn's terms by a basic technology, which is attached to source of energy. So basically, source of energy used by that civilization defines architecture, machinery, industry, construction, anything that that civilization does. So before steam engine, what was the ultimate, the only source of energy for any civilization? Huh? Animals, right, good, great. But source of energy, where did energy come from? Fire. Fire. Sun, oh. soil, soil energy. But if you wanted to move things around, what would you do? Yeah? Muscles. The only source of energy was the kinetic energy generated by our muscles. So if you wanted to move things, what you had to do, you had to go and move things. <laughs> uh, then animals had it. Yeah, they, they were more powerful. They were more resilient, so they had muscular energy of animals added to, to the human muscle energy. And everything changed with steam engine. Almost 10 years after the agrarian revolution, the fir first industrial revolution came. And we had a very different source of energy, the steam energy, energy coming from steam. Then they had internal combustion engine. The one we use today, most of our cars run on internal combustion, which is more powerful, more compact, generate more power. That is one of the basic technologies we have right now. Right. What happens, the first principle that Thomas Kuhn observed was that any change in basic technology does not come in evolutionary way. It comes in a revolutionary way. That's why the book was called the structure of scientific revolutions. So basically, when we have a basic energy, basic technology, when new source of energy, new source of technology comes, everything connected to old basic technology is what? Dumped. It just goes out of the sea. 
when I'm finished, I'll go out and I'll go home. So anything we just connected to uh, an old basic technology just dies off. We don't use it anymore. Like anything connected to steam engines, the steamboats, uh, steam engines, anything is obsolete. We don't use it anymore. We use it sometimes. I mean, you could see it in museums. If you go to an uh, old Astana railway station, you go out, you look on your right, what do you see? Old, big, black steam engine. The one they used 50, 60 years ago. That it's standing there, not used. Just a sign, a symbol of old piece of technology we used to have. So any change in basic technology happens in a revolutionary way. New technology replaces old technology completely. That is the way, the, that's the principle, that's the philosophy behind that change. The second principle, which is even more important nowadays, which is becoming very important during the fourth industrial revolution, is speed. Velocity, speed of change is increasing. First agrarian revolution happened 10,000 years ago. First industrial revolution happened almost 10,000 years later, in 1765. Second industrial revolution happened 100 years later. The third, 60 years later. And fourth is happening right now, 40, 50 years after the third. Industrial revolution. So speed of change is increasing. In fact, that is the first thing that fourth industrial revolution has dramatically, radically changed in existence of human being, of humankind, is speed, velocity. We live, as we speak, in a non-human world right now because the speed, the velocity of anything, of all the basic major processes, of information exchange, of transportation, uh, anything has increased dramatically. We become too slow. We're living in a world which is too fast for us. Imagine boxing. GGG's last fight, yeah? You look on a boxing ring, and there are, I know some people in the room who actually visited the uh, a Team Auburn Arena in Las Vegas several days ago, several weeks ago. So you look at a boxing match, and something happens out there, right? And you need what? To understand what happened in detail. You need slow motion. Because your human, your brain cannot detect what happened. And then you look the slow motion, and you see, <laughs> Both. You know, he cheated him five times, Jesus, and he lost. What the hell is happening? Or the last World Cup, it was in Russia, the football World Cup. The first time in history of FIFA, they introduced what? Wow. 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 Um, they introduced video, whatever it's called, thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. where, yeah, right, so then. Yeah, Video to referee when something happens, he just you know he shows this sign and then he steps off the field, he looks in slow motion and he makes a decision. Because you know, there were too many unfair decisions and they decided FIFA finally decided, okay, we'll just make you know the be whatever system, the referee the system so that you know there would be more fair decisions and you know everybody would be more happy with. Um, thinking about, about another thing, typing. Right. So we need to put a program of Toastmasters Club. Right. <laughs> Jesus, can you believe, I mean, can you imagine how slow we are in typing and in, in introducing a small piece of information about this small event? It will take, I don't know, how many hours? One day, six <laughs> hours, eight hours. Sometimes a week, sometimes <laughs> to finalize the program. But, but just, just give me an example. Give me an, any, any, I don't know how long. Six hours? Half an hour, but still automation. Oh, automation. <laughs> Half an hour, but still. Imagine, it takes 30 minutes, half an hour to put one small piece of information. 
Imagine terabytes and gigabytes and whatever what is this is, it's the bigger, bigger number of information passing every day in, 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 in automated systems and information systems. We are too slow. But the biggest thing that fourth industrial revolution has brought on the table is changing, is something very different. All the three industrial revolutions in our history, they've changed many things. They've changed the way we communicate, we've changed the way we transport, they've changed the way we build things, they've changed too many things, everything, beside one particular thing, which was always a natural human monopoly, which was always the domain of a human being, which is? Breathe, eat, <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, no, something different that only humans can do, the only thing that humans can do.